but for now, maybe we'll tell you also. We are about to reach the top of the mountain, and uh, soon enough, when we will be going down. Look at people, it is stunning. Hashtag SWAT, here we come. historical region located in present-day northwest Pakistan and eastern Afghanistan. It's a region which is incredibly uh, beautiful. You have a succession of, of uh, valleys and basins and, and uh, high mountains and we traveled there not so long ago and, and it's every time striking how beautiful it is. I'm Jessie Ponce. I'm a junior professor for the history of South Asian religions at, at Ceres. I'm trained as an art historian with a focus on South Asian art and more specifically on early Buddhist art and more specifically on Gandharan Buddhist art. And um, at Ceres, I explore the early history of Buddhism through the glance of material culture. I'm currently the project leader of, the, of DIGA. DIGA is short for Digitization of Gandharan Artifacts, a project for the preservation and study of Buddhist art from Pakistan. My name is Frederik Elvert and my field is uh, digital humanities and religious studies and the combination of the two. So how can we apply digital research methods in the study of religions? Uh, my name is Serena Otiero and I'm a researcher attached to the DIGA project. I have an archaeological training and mostly um, in this moment I'm very busy with describing the pieces from the collection that has been digitized. I'm Cristiano Muscatelli. I am a research associate in the DIGA project and I'm trained as an art historian. And in the DIGA project I'm responsible for the photographic documentation during the field trips and of the entering of the object's metadata. My name is Sarah Rautert and I am the student assistant in the project. So that basically means that I um, was helping everyone else in the project with all their tasks. So uh, since I started my uh, bachelor's studies here at Ceres, um, I was uh, completely interested in um, the courses that Jesse Pons gave. And now at the end of my master, I guess I also uh, know a bit of Gandhara. Why is this place so special? It was a Buddhist homeland 2000 years ago and it's a region that we can connect with the first um, depictions of the Buddha as a human being, although we see them occur elsewhere. And these um, sculptures, they show a mix of different cultures. So you have um, classical sculptures with classical lines, let's say Greek iconography and an Indian iconography and some Iranian features that all come into play in, this, in these images. And uh, he is portrayed as a, as a human being or as a superhuman being, you know, he's not quite human. So you have to add a few features, a few, a few motifs to, to convey his extra, extraordinary nature. So he would, for instance, have a, a, a little tuft of hair between his, um, his eyes or um, a cranial protuberance. So you see all this uh, iconography being put into place in a region like Gandhara. And they're just plainly exquisite, to be honest. Before we see these uh, images of the Buddha depicted as a human being, uh, the Buddha was depicted as, um, let's say, symbols. So for instance, um, as the wheel of the Buddhist Dharma, the wheel of the Buddhist teaching, or by his uh, footprints. The thing is, you have a lot of objects that um, have been published, uh, that are in museum collections, but you also have a lot of objects that were never documented, that were just looted and um, transferred from one place to the other. And there is one interesting corpus 
which comes from uh, the area around Chakdara, which is the, a modern city in northwest Pakistan. And these objects were excavated in the 60s by um, the Pakistani archaeological teams. And um, they are now preserved in the Deer Museum in Chakdara. And we're talking about 1,500 or 2,000 objects. At this stage, the, the main project is really about creating a digital corpus or creating digital representations of these actual objects. So the main instructor for this workshop was Kalin, the two. That's a nice photo with Kalin in front of the, of the statue. Yeah. yeah, the location okay. was the Peshawar Museum, so where one of the best collections of Gandharan art is preserved. So it's also very impressive, uh, the, um, the whole setting. Also because the first uh, meeting was right in the entrance in the hall of the museum with, with all the yeah. biggest stadiums of the Buddhas around. So we also have these nice uh, pictures with Kalin just next to Buddha and getting the, the same knowledge from him. <laughs> uh, there was this final uh, session in the gardens that is also really lovely uh, where they could experiment with taking um, uh, landscape pictures of the museum. There's a sort of, of danger of like re replicating colonial structures in that, I mean, like a hundred years ago, people just traveled there and took whatever they could find and brought it to European museums. And now we're going there and taking all of these pictures and taking them on European hard drives. Um, but the question of what do Pakistani researchers actually gain from a project like this was also very central to how we also talked with our Pakistani partners and colleagues to, to see is there actually um, anything that wouldn't only benefit us, but that is also crucial for their perspective on, on this topic. That's the first step. They actually they now have a good overview of, of the topic, I guess. Of the possibilities that are yeah. out there. We took a bit of time off uh, after the workshop to visit the old city of Peshawar. And what is interesting in the old city is that it still has uh, remains of um, different historical periods from the uh, yeah, Islamic architecture and uh, colonial period. And also we have a Hindu temple in the middle of Peshawar. field trip we had a very tight schedule because we started early in the morning and uh, started the commute that in the morning was uh, really really pleasant because actually nobody was around because the area can be pretty jammed with traffic but in the morning it was just lovely and we could enjoy the sun rising from behind the mountains and the, the beautiful views on the on the river Oh no, in the morning in it was like 40-50 minutes. Yeah, and in, in, in the afternoon, yeah. almost two hours. Because of the traffic. Because of the, the traffic, yeah, yeah. Six days a week for three weeks. During the trip, uh, we had some quirky moments of fun, like crossing oh, yeah. the bridge was one of our favorites. 
and we are now approaching our favorite road. No, bridge. Uh, Cross the bridge to the Swat Valley, and then there's another what, 20 minutes uh, drive. It's a long straight road, uh, and on each side you have buildings of uh, the University of Malacan, which is a very big university. And like once you've passed the university, you enter Chagdara, and just at the entrance of the city, on the right, you enter the museum. It's behind, you know, closed doors and Ali, the driver, would honk once and then they would open the door and we would enter this lovely garden. Uh, and uh, I think everyone would just be out of bed and just had breakfast, really. I mean, we would arrive there around 7.30 um, and we would be ready to start off day of, of work after Christian has had a cigarette in the garden, of course. So the first step when pieces were taken out from the storage by people of the museum uh, was to register their entering, physically entering the museum from the storage and uh, having them clean enough to be photographed. At the entrance of the museum, there were the cleaning station for the pieces. Pieces needs to be cleaned before being taken pictures of, uh, mostly to remove dust and the spider webs uh, and then they were taken to the um, kind of stations that uh, were mostly mattresses put on the ground where um, mostly i was there measuring them and from this first station then one piece at a time were taken from the photographers one of the photographers was cristiano and then uh, the pieces that were taken pictures of would not go back to the first uh, mat but they were going to another mat that was signed with blue tape. The in was the yellow tape, the out was the blue tape, so that people from the museum were, uh, could take them back to the storage rooms. On the busiest day, we had three 2D photograph stations with three photographers. And in the room on the back, we had a station for uh, 3D documentation. That was Kalin uh, Kingdom. We selected... Uh about 60 objects uh, before. We had a list prepared. And then there were some pieces we thought, oh, it would be good to uh, add this to the list. <laughs> so Kalin was doing 3D modeling and then we selected some pieces for another type of documentation, not 2D, not 3D, but HRTI. And um, it is basically a photography technique where you actually see that very nicely here where you have the camera which is attached above and the source of lightning which changes so it enhances some of the very low reliefs that some of the objects had the, the idea is basically like if you take a flashlight and move around the object to try and see the inscriptions to see like if you cast the light from a specific angle then like the shadow might drop in a way that you actually see more of the of the inscription and but the, the nice thing is that now if you if you do it with this technique you can actually do it from your computer at home so you can move a virtual flashlight around mm. so you don't have to like choose which angle is the best but you can actually like when you research the piece still try different lighting situations the pieces came there after they were excavated in sites in the area objects like these come from archaeological sites are there are many that are fragmentary instead. There are not so many uh, whole pieces that um, are those that usually take position in museum exhibitions. What we see in the museum is always a selection. It's always a selection and there's always a lot in the, in the storage rooms. Uh, so this kind of project also has this idea of making available everything that is in the museum, not only what is on display in the windows. And this is one side of, of the digitization. The other side, which is like 
maybe a little less visible is actually the description of these objects. So in order to actually be able to, to do something with them, it's important to have a lot of contextual information to be able to, to search for certain motifs, to, be, to know what is on these objects in the first place. So, and there's, this is an area where like a lot of art historical expertise goes in to actually describe each object in detail what is on this. And then you have something that, that you traditionally have, you have like a, uh, like a paragraph describing this object. But if you actually want to be able to link this to other collections, for example, then sometimes researchers do use different words for the same, the same object, right? We had it like, you have like a pillow or a cushion, right? And if you don't use the exact same word, then it's difficult to find all of the depictions of pillows and cushions uh, because the, the description might not match. So for this purpose, we um, developed something that you can call a controlled vocabulary or a thesaurus, which is like a list of terms that should be used to describe a certain motif. For example, uh, in the collection from the Dear Museum in Chaktara, uh, we noticed that there's a um, quite a big number of ascetics depicted in them. Uh, and uh, looking at, we already had a typology of the different kinds of ascetics that we had, what they were holding or not holding, but then uh, we find new variation. For example, just yesterday, we were, Cristiano was describing a piece and um, it's quite common to have ascetic holding, for example, bowls for offering or to collect food and arms uh, around. But in this case, uh, we just saw that the, the arm was full, there was food inside. And this is a first for us uh, during this work. Uh, so now we need to uh, figure out how to add food to our, uh, to our vocabulary. Important parts of the, of the day were the breaks. And we would have a tea break in the morning and one in the afternoon and, uh, and a lunch break. And now, during last time, uh, Cristiano is rescuing a honeybee that was lost. Yeah, I was trying to rescue a bee. Uh, I was feeding it with uh, water and sugar, and even uh, name it. Uh, bzz. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it unfortunately didn't make it. So. And in the weekend, we took some trips. Well, one weekend, mostly. And we went to Taktibai and Jamalgari, and these are two of the most famous archaeological sites um, of Gandhara, so Buddhist sites. And they're, st I mean, they're in stunning locations. Jamalgari and Taktibai are two um, excellent examples of that. You know, they are located in a, in a hillside in somewhat secluded places, and they're really on the, at the top of hills, so they have the view there is stunning. Um, it's a long, oh, not really long, but it's a hard climb every time, but it's certainly worth the sport. It's, it's the end of the project, but we still had a, have a lot of work to, to do. And um, yeah, we would like to continue, uh, perhaps working on a different collection, perhaps working on uh, the archaeological sites that uh, these objects come from. And we need to write new applications and then perhaps uh, the digging can reform in, in this constellation or another. This project is really like a, a digitization project. So, and I'm, I'm really glad that we, we managed to do all of this. And by me, I mean you. So, so going there and, and actually documenting all these pieces is really what we what we hope for it's also like a new beginning in a way because now you have all of these materials that actually needs to be researched so i mean uh, up to now we we documented it and and this makes accessible a collection that was really hard to to access and to to really study in depth and this is now the work that, that actually begins now. And so yesterday we were together for the first time since Pakistan because we all, you know, some of us are in Borom, some of us are elsewhere. And we sent a, a selfie to our colleagues in Pakistan and to Kaling and they were like, oh, the gang is back together. They are so, such a lovely person. So. They're so patient and, I mean, 
uh, it's, uh, it's always uh, hard to leave because uh, we are also leaving friends and people we got to know more and more every time we travel there. And so we keep in touch now and text every now and then. And we like to imagine that they're desperate to see us back in Pakistan. To see the sunrise over the Swat River is a sight that one should have at least once in his lifetime or her lifetime. And I'm so glad that I did.